Okay, let's talk about how we murder stars, y'all. Let's talk about how we murder stars. We did it to ourselves! Yeah. Iron is the element in the periodic table of Mendeleev that happens to be, from a nuclear point of view, most stable. What I mean by that is the following. If I take two protons and crash them together, I can make deuterium, which is what the sun does in abundance in its core. And then I can crash deuterium together with more protons. I can build up helium. Then I can build up carbon, magnesium, oxygen, all the inter... You know, he reminds me of like a teacher from high school, but I'm not sure which one. Not my history teacher. Because he looked like a fucking Neanderthal. He was a really cool dude, but he... I don't, I don't know, man. I, I just don't know. I don't know. But he reminds me of a teacher I had in school growing up. Like, if, if you were 90s kids, you he has the look. This is definitely from the 90s. This is videos from space. This is 12 years ago. Yeah. Ooh, that's going to be nice to look at, too. We're already on a kick with this, so might as well. Immediate weight elements in the oh, periodic table. Then I can build up carbon, magnesium, oxygen, all the intermediate weight elements in the periodic table up to iron. And every we time I do that, I get energy out. Those reactions are, are exothermic. Canadian? I get more energy out than I put in. And so... Does anyone else think it's funny that the, that the chemical, um, that the elemental, uh, whatever it is for iron is fe? And the Fae can't be around iron. Ain't that some fucking shit? Ain't that some bullshit? Like, when you really think about it, that's a, that's an insult to the Fae itself. Touche, scientists, for not giving a fuck. Touche. It's a way of feeding energy into the core of a star. Iron is a problem. When a star tries to fuse iron, iron actually takes energy in when it fuses. So if you fuse iron, you're actually absorbing energy instead of letting energy out to support the star. Mm -hmm. That's bad. A star... Now, there's this thing, and I can't remember if it was in my Isis Thesis book or my Road from Orion book, but in one of those two books, it mentions something about, and I don't know if it's a theory or if it's been determined or whatnot, but, like, the constellation Orion distributes iron out towards our galaxy or at least our solar system possibly which is just like i, I guess so, since we all want to go swimming in a goddamn circle might as well chasing after shit would it be very interesting if, if, if in that case the the sun's just like no get away and that's where the magnetosphere comes from it's just like oh this fucking thing y'all iron motherfucker y'all like it down there like y y there's carbon suck on that shit die a couple milliseconds after it begins to form iron in its core because now instead of energy supporting all that gravity it's taking it up and the star collapses and this collapse is the precursor to what we call a supernova explosion because the collapse is so violent the core just collapses and all the material of the star collapses around it and the temperatures inside that go so high that they fuse every other single chemical that we know of in the universe iron is a problem when a star tries to fuse iron, iron actually takes energy in when it fuses. Mm -hmm. So if you fuse iron, you're actually absorbing energy instead of letting energy out to support the star. That's bad. A star will die a couple milliseconds after it begins to form iron in its core. Because now, instead of energy supporting all that gravity, it's taking it up and the star collapses. And this collapse is the precursor to what we call a supernova explosion. Because the collapse is so violent, the core just collapses and all the material of the star collapses around it. And the temperatures inside that go so high that they fuse every other single chemical that we know of in the universe in an instant, in a millisecond. So, for example, uh, gold. I always have to think of the gold in my wedding ring. Gold is a more complex element than iron. It's actually a heavier element than iron. And the only thing in the universe that forms a gold atom is a supernova explosion. So when you think about things like gold or silver, or in fact, even the iron in your blood, that iron was formed the very instant a star died. You hear that? We're all fucking murderers. 
I'm just saying, if there's ever a time if a space shuttle with human beings ever accidentally aims for the sun, we are fucked. We are fucked. It doesn't even need much. It doesn't need much. It just, it just needs, a, like, a drop of blood, of iron in our blood, and that is enough. And we can kill a star. But then there's the solar winds and all of this shit that blows them back all onto this planet and like all the irony is just like, no, nah, get away from me, fucker. Like, like, it just, it's like, nah, you can be in my orbit, but six feet. Y'all got that plague going on. You got something else going on. They were trying to hide that shit again back, back in China. I don't know why. It's like a new pneumonia or some shit. Don't mind me. I'm just rambling on. I'm just making shit up. It can't be true, right? I hope not, but it probably is. Look at that star, poor guy. Now let's at look like why ta it's time stops in a black hole, which is like okay. Everyone's space time is different from everyone else. Mind you, um, this is what I normally like regularly pretty much watch. Like I like shit like this. It feeds my imagination and shit. This. No one can what exist in space exactly where I am, thus no one can experience what? time exactly how I do. What? But your space-time is pretty much exactly like mine, so your experiences are humanly identical. Black holes warp space Hold on a second, I didn't rewind that back. Them is very much different Why was he climbing on that us. guy? In the last video- Why is he climbing on him? Everyone's space-time is different from everyone else's. No one can exist in space exactly where I am, thus no one can experience time exactly how I do. Okay. But your space time is pretty much exactly like mine, so your experiences are humanly identical. Black holes warp space time, meaning space time near them is very much different from space time near us. In the that last video horizon. we saw that this means space behaved very differently than what we expected. Now let's explore what this warpage means for time. That's weird. I like this. This is weird. Although the distortions oh, in space channel? make it essentially impossible to orbit near a black hole, we can still get very close if we have strong engines and stronger bones. Mm. If we simply point our engines towards the singularity, we can resist the sultry curves of the black hole and get closer. This of course means our engines need to output more and more thrust the nearer we get, which means the occupants will experience a greater and greater downward force smushing them into their seats. Ugh. This is not a pleasant scenario, so we're going to pretend our ship has some sort of anti-gravity device. What happens as we get closer? Orienting ourselves is not the easiest thing. As we descend, the black hole bends more and more light from the horizon down into it. This causes the ever-consuming blackness to bend up around us. Mm. As we pass through the photon sphere, the last possible chance for light to arrive directly from the horizon vanishes. Geometrically, we are still outside of the black hole, but to our eyes, it looks like we've now entered inside. The further we go, the more light bends away from us, and our window of the universe above shrinks. This creates a bit of a conundrum. How do we know when we've reached the event horizon? What is the black hole? Why do we fear the black hole? You know, like, like the other day when I was like doing the whole like space time thing, it, it was as it was a suggestion of myself. It's just like, what if the, our entire universe, like, it does go in a circle, but it's inverted or concave because we're all in this giant dome? And what if the black hole is a way out of it, or even a wormhole? I really don't know. I'm just speculating and being a dumbass right now. It's just nice to, like, fantasize, though. But it is interesting to know that, like, we can only speculate what happens with these black holes from the idea of, like, we're, like, going into an area that's outside of where we are. And... Bye, everything. I have to be on my way. Unlike the ISCO and the photon sphere, there's no tangible boundary we can point at and say, ah, there it is. Down here, everything is as black as black can be. That poor space There's two scared. things we can do to counter this. The first is just simply watching our ever-shrinking window above us. When that shrinks to a point, we are directly above the event horizon. Or we can measure the distance between the ISCO and the photon sphere and divide that by three. Once we've traveled that distance beyond the photon sphere, we've crossed the event horizon. Our ship has fancy no. computers and thus uses those distances to calculate and then project a hologram of where the event horizon is for us to see. Finally, we reach our destination. 
1.01 shore shield radii from shore the singularity, shield. just above the event horizon. That's an interesting our name. Our engine is thrusting with unimaginable force and our anti-gravity device working overtime to keep us comfortable. Now we can experiment to observe the strange new reality we inhabit. Before descending into the black hole, we left a probe orbiting above at the ISCO. Every time the probe passed overhead, it sent out a radio wave signal at 10 MHz. A light wave's frequency is time dependent. If our time is different down here near the event horizon, we should observe a frequency other than 10 MHz. The equation for time dilation is this, where x is the distance in shore shield radii from the singularity, okay. and the reference frame is of someone very far from the black hole. Okay. Our orbiting probe is not very far from the black hole, so we need to calculate the time for both of these. We find that at 1.01 shore shield radii, our time is running at 12% the rate of our probe. So okay. for every second that passes here, 8.3 seconds passes for it. Oh. When we measure the emitted radio wave frequency, we see that it's jumped to 83 megahertz. Time is indeed running slower here relative to those further away. Now the most important question to ask is, but why? For some reason, the universe has decided that physics should behave the exact same way no matter where you are within it. This is the concept of general relativity. No matter your reference frame, light will always travel at the speed of light. Since speed or velocity is a measurement of space and time, then the only way to keep light at the speed of light for every reference frame is to make modifications to space and time. Let's look at the space-time around our black hole. This is an embedding diagram. It's a two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional space. Just like how we in three dimensions can't observe the fourth dimension, Why is there a dip? those living here can't observe the third. So even though in reality objects will be moving along curves, those in this world cannot see them. Without gravity, out here far away from the black hole, objects move through space exactly how we'd imagine them to in two dimensions. However, let's see what happens when a photon approaches our black hole. Photons are light and thus must move at a constant velocity. Yet as we watch our photon from the point of view of someone within the universe, the photon appears to start slowing down. What the fuck? Something Why is it is dipping here. though? Although we cannot observe light in this manner, this Why is, is it going down a hole? Happening. The space around the black hole becomes more and more bent into the higher dimension. Thus, part of our photon's journey that we can only observe in the lower dimension is occurring through the unobservable higher dimension. Therefore, time itself slows down in gravity wells in order to allow light to transverse this extra distance. Why must the speed of light always appear the speed of light? I don't know. There's not really a reason except then physics wouldn't work. But why does it go down instead of into the hole? Why, why is it going down a hole instead of going in the actual? There's a whole fucking black ass circle. Blacker than my ass. Right there. But, it, but, it, but it's traveling like, down an endless pipe. And I doubt... Like, where... So is it like a whirlpool? Or like... One of those... Weird knife dudes from the Final Fantasy games you gotta watch out for because they got like endless XP and you're just going to die. You're not killing this thing. It's gonna get you. You wouldn't think the little dude with the knife is gonna do 10 stacks worth of damage, but oh, he came back and he did two dimes the hit. So you're fucked, man. Uh, so it, it, like, I, I'm, like I'm sitting here, like I really, like I like watching shit like this, but I'm like dumb. I'm not stupid, but I'm dumb. And I'm sitting here and it's like... Oh, is that how a black hole works? But why is it go going down into a hole and not into the thing that made the hole? So now I have something that does research. Okay. <laughs> it's important to remember that for every instance along our light's journey, it appears to be moving at the speed of light for anyone at that frame of reference. If we decided to start here and move away, we would see that the light seems to speed up the further it gets from the black hole. This diagram also shows gravitational acceleration. From the point of view of someone falling into the black hole, they will simply travel in a straight line at constant velocity. But because time starts running slower, they will arrive sooner than they expected. Now you have the philosophical question of, 
is arriving at a destination sooner than expected different from arriving somewhere at a faster speed. But really, they are two descriptions of the same thing. At the event horizon, gravity appears undefined. That is to say, the slope or tangent of space-time appears completely vertical. That means space or gravity is flowing at the speed of light, and thus all of the light's movement is in the higher dimension, meaning it can't move anywhere in the lower dimension. Thus, time halts. I must stress this is all relative, and appears undefined is the key phrase. Mathematically, the curve looks like this down to infinity. But for our observer, this far out, space is moving at the speed of light here, meaning it appears completely contracted along the direction of motion, and thus it looks completely vertical or undefined. Relativity is weird. So why don't you just go up? The last question we will tackle today is, what does it mean then to interact with the event horizon, or the place where time seems to stand still? Can you really not go past it and come back? What if we stuck a really long pole from our spaceship out past the event horizon and then pulled it back? Surely that would be possible, right? Well first, it's a ludicrous notion. No materials would be able to maintain integrity that close to and resisting the gravitational acceleration of our black hole. But it doesn't hurt to think about. The first caveat to explore is that we like to think objects are one complete thing. That the two ends of our rods are part of a single entity. So when I move this part of the rod forward, the other end moves simultaneously as well. However, what really happens is that you apply a pressure front of electrons pushing against electrons that travels almost the speed of light through our rod. As we descend our extremely crazy long rod down towards the event horizon, time for the end closest moves slower than for the end we are holding on to. So one of two things is going to happen, and both seem equally valid. The first theory is that the end of the pole at the event horizon perceives time further from it to move ludicrously fast. Thus, as you push the rod towards it, it receives all of those pressure waves from electrons very quickly, and it explodes or breaks apart. But you wouldn't be able to observe this, as the light from the event horizon would be too redshifted to see. The second theory is that compared to the end we are holding on to, time near the event horizon is running ludicrously slow. You know, I kind of feel like they, they should have shown the people with the anti-gravity thing turned off. Because the whole it, shattering and squishing and whatever, that that did not register in my head until it happened. It's just like, oh yeah, the gravity. Now I understand. Because I totally forgot gravity was a fucking thing. I was sitting there looking at it. It's like, why is it going down though? Gravity. And excess. Excess creates a very strong pulling force which would snap the rod much like a rope breaking from too much weight. I honestly have no idea and will not guess which is more likely. This does not mean that if you fall into the event horizon you will explode or be ripped apart. This is merely a product of the fact that being motionless near the event horizon and further from it are two completely different states of being, and those two states don't like being connected to one another. Once you let go of the rod, it becomes an inertial reference frame and suddenly everything is fine. This is because, although time is running slower for the part of the rod near the event horizon, the matter has also accelerated and is moving faster than the matter in the rod further from the event horizon. This balances out and thus our rod falls in as if it was anywhere else in the universe. Thus concludes our in-depth look at the distortions of space-time So as long as you're hole. moving, you're good. There are many other things to discuss about these unreal phenomena. The fact that they can have charges or spin, Hawking radiation, and their temperature. Perhaps these are topics to return to another day. But the next question to ask is, why and how do black holes form? Total, you got that? Yeah, you do. Let's watch this one. A black hole forms in two main scenarios. Either too much material reaches the core of a star during its collapse, or, or a neutron star accumulates more material until it exceeds 2.1 to 3 solar masses. That's pretty. why they look specifically like that. Like, I know it's been observed, but it's just like, why do they look like that? The most direct like method a fucking of forming a black hole from comes during the death of very massive stars. 
As stars burn, the denser products from their fusion collect at the core. If the stars are massive enough, those products will eventually become further fuel, who then deposit even denser products onto the core. In the final day of a massive star's life, the silicon at the core will fuse, producing iron at astonishing rates. This sphere of iron will continue growing in mass until the pressure within it passes the Chandrasekhar limit or high energy photons break apart the iron nuclei, at which point it will collapse. During the collapse, a shockwave is formed as the core rebounds from its extreme densities. As the shockwave travels out, it stalls for a few hundredths of a second. During this period, neutrinos produced from the core accumulate behind the shockwave until the accumulated energy restarts it and fuels the forthcoming supernova. At the same time as this accumulation, material that has already passed through the shockwave continues accreting or building up on the proto-neutron star core. If enough material reaches the core, gravitational instability will occur, causing a collapse into a black hole. Really? Okay. If this happens before the shockwave is restarted, then the core will immediately cease to create more neutrinos, and those already formed will disappear within the event horizon. This drop in pressure behind the shockwave causes the whole star to collapse within, producing no explosion. For certain large mass stars, between 25 and 40 solar masses, the shockwave is restarted before the core is pushed beyond gravitational stability. This results in a supernova that leaves behind a black hole. Huh. This explosion would be weaker in comparison, as the core can no longer produce more neutrinos to further fuel the supernova. The next question to ask then is, why would some stars' shockwaves fail where others succeed? Truly massive stars, we are talking masses greater than arches. 40 solar masses, ah, accrete look at that so arches. much material on their- You see that, arches? You, you see that? Not only do they make excellent watercolor paper, they make badass fucking stars. Look at it. Purple as fuck. Solar masses accrete so much material on their collapsed core that a black hole forms before the shockwave can restart. As the star collapses, its innards continue being absorbed into the event horizon, and thus, after a couple hours, the star will be completely enveloped within the boundaries of the black hole. Not every massive star will experience this fate. Two stars with the same mass can leave behind two different remnants. The driving factor for this is what is known as metallicity. Metallicity, with regards to stars, refers to the composition of elements larger than hydrogen or helium in a star's mass. For reference, our sun has a metallicity of about 1.5%. Or that is to say, 1.5% of the sun's mass are elements heavier than helium. When astrophysicists talk about the masses of stars, they are referring to its initial mass. This is the mass of the star once the fusion of hydrogen begins in their cores. Happy birthday! When we refer to metallicity, we are also talking about the initial composition. As we look at this diagram showing that higher metallicities produce fewer black holes, this value is referring to the metallicity when the star was born, not when it collapses. Okay, so black holes basically have no metallicity, as in they're old as fuck. They don't get birthday cake because they already done eat too much, and they're greedy as fuck. Um, whereas all the other ones with higher metallicity um, are a bit more profound and they're able to feed off of what they produce with their supernova explosion in order to save themselves. But I guess a black hole with the supernova, it's a, well, black hole with supernova and then black hole, um, I guess it's all different. But I guess if it has enough metallicity or it's high enough for its mass and shit like that, it might be safe. Um, but I'm not a scientist and I'm not that smart, so. Thus, the next question to ask is why does increased metallicity reduce black hole formation? I like that. The high energy from fusion and thermal collisions within a star releases an immense amount of photons. These photons are absorbed or scatter around within the star for hundreds of thousands of years. Each one of these collisions exerts a minuscule amount of radiative pressure or force. That means, on average, the photons produced within the star are ever so slightly pushing the matter of the star outwards towards the surface. 
Larger atom nuclei, or metallics, have more protons and thus a greater positive charge. Okay. This means they can attract more electrons around them. This creates a larger pool of electron energy states, meaning these electrons can absorb a larger sample of photon energy levels. All of this fancy talk is to say, gases containing metals are more opaque, or harder for light to pass through, mm. than gases of just hydrogen and helium. That means more photons collide with this matter, causing more of that radiative force pushing outwards. This trapping of heat causes more intense convection currents within the star, which, coupled with the heightened solar winds, cause matter to be blown away from the star over time. Here we can see how much mass a 90 solar mass star will lose in its lifetime depending on its metallicity. Thus, a larger metallicity will actually cause a star to lose more mass during its lifetime particularly in the final stages. This makes it less likely to form a black hole when its life cycle ends. If a star's death leaves behind a neutron star, there still is a possibility to form a black hole. Generally, neutron stars have a mass of about 1.4 solar masses. No, I mean, that this is quite far from them. the more than 2.1 solar mass value mentioned at the start of the video. Thus, the most viable method for a neutron star to accumulate enough mass to reach this value is to interact with another stellar object. The most likely scenario for this event happening is in binary systems. Binary systems, or binary stars, are two stellar objects that are gravitationally bound to each other, orbiting around their common center of mass. In the early universe, Neutron stars could often be found in binary systems, since, if there is enough gas to form a star large enough to produce a neutron star, there is usually enough to form another within the same region. So like sister stars, okay. Anytime mass is accelerated, it produces gravitational waves. Therefore, objects orbiting each other are slowly losing minuscule amounts of energy as gravitational waves travel away. The strength of the energy lost from this is very strongly dependent on the distance between the orbiting bodies, as seen in this equation Professor Jeffries was kind enough to share Oh, that's a lot of math. This represents the approximate time scale to merger for a system in a circular orbit. Okay. To get an idea of how weak and how long it takes for this decay to occur, let's imagine a pair of equal mass neutron stars orbiting with a separation of 2 million kilometers. This is equivalent to a little over five times the moon's distance from Earth. At this distance, it will take roughly two billion years before they merge. It is initially a very weak and very gradual process, dealing with orbits far smaller than we are accustomed to. Nevertheless, two billion years is much less than the age of the universe. Many mergers have already occurred and many more still have hundreds of millions of years to go. But the very l It's almost like the backwards variation of when um cells divide almost. Does that make sense? It's almost like two cells joining together. Or something. I'm thinking of something where it joins together. I'm not sure what, but this is one of them. Last part of the orbital decay. Or that one game everyone was playing where they were just a circle and they were eating other circles and then like they got and became bigger circles or some shit. Or like the game, or that snake game on your Nokia. If you're old enough to know what the uh, fuck I'm talking about. Where binary neutron star systems get very interesting. Normal stars aren't able to orbit very close to each other. Their surfaces will collide long before loss of orbital energy to gravitational waves plays a significant factor. But neutron stars are so dense, with radii of just Not 10 endless. kilometers, that they can achieve extremely close orbits. I like his details. The whole Paler binary system is also... A shout out to Butt Wise channel, because that's his... I'm watching right now, that in the last video, because their visuals are absolutely fucking stunning. Thank you very much. ...operated by about 2 million kilometers. Who's got wings? Except this orbit is eccentric, so it transitions from roughly 3 million kilometers to just under 750,000. Why's it got wings? These are two objects with more mass than the sun orbiting within a little over a sun's radius of each other. If they were suns, it would look like this. Even at these close proximities, it is calculated to take another 300 million years before they merge. Now, 
Let's fast forward to the final hour before but the why merger. is he flapping? One hour before two neutron stars merge, they are separated by a distance of about a thousand kilometers. So like California? They're completing California? three orbits every second, traveling at 6% the speed of light. Each revolution liberates six times 10 to the 39th joules of energy into gravitational waves. This is the equivalent to what the sun produces over a half a million years. One minute before merger, they are still separated by roughly 360 on, kilometers, completing 14 orbits every second at 11% the speed of light. Over the last 2 billion years, around 7 times 10 to the 44th joules, or 5 sun lifetimes worth of energy, have been radiated away to reach this point. This staggering amount is less than 10% of what's to come. Only during this final minute are the gravitational waves being produced All large enough to, to be get detected together and make a here fucking on baby. Earth. The final second before merger, they are still 100 kilometers apart, traveling about 20% the speed of light. At this point, the tidal forces are so extreme the neutron stars begin to deform. At 30 to 40 kilometers, oh God, the neutron like stars eggs. are ripped apart as their masses slam together, meeting at the center. This final collapse liberates roughly the same amount of gravitational energy as a core collapse supernova. About Did anyone else take a Dragon Ball Z fusion with the kids? Was it in Goat Tanks? Go ahead and Trunks, Goat Tanks? Is that what I'm th Yeah, I think that's what I'm thinking of. The sun lifetimes worth of energy. But instead of neutrinos, this energy is lost primarily to gravitational waves. This extreme event is known as a kilonova. The, kilo the so-called kilonova are 1 to 10% as bright as core collapse supernovae. It is thought that these events are a potential source for the creation of the majority of the heaviest elements in the universe, and so-called short-duration gamma ray bursts that last a few seconds. Although the details are awesome, I won't go into them, as this process deserves its own video someday. But the end result, after everything has settled, can be a rapidly spinning black hole. The last, slightly less exciting method to form a black hole occurs when a neutron star is in a binary system with a regular star. As the star's volume increases in the later stages of its life, the outer layers of the star can become more strongly attracted to the neutron star's gravity than its host stars. Okay, let me mom this, this matter is then passed yeah. over to it via a roche Oh my overflow. god, it's Lilith's petals! This accreting material can add to the neutron star's mass, but how efficiently is uncertain. X-ray bursts during accretion events such as these suggest that material that reaches the extreme surface detonates fuck? and could be ejected away. What the if enough manages to settle there, eventually gravitational- There can only be one star in this galaxy, motherfucker, and it ain't gonna be you with your tiny- That's what that star said to the little neutron star, poor- He just started spitting shit on him, and all of a sudden he caught on fire, poor guy. Now he's busting gas and shit everywhere. It wasn't even gas, so he was minding his own business. <laughs> and, and the regular star was just like, I- I-, I, I like the black hole sends you to the gods. Like, what the fuck is this? Nigga, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat you too. I'm gonna eat you too. You wait. Stability will occur, causing a collapse into a black hole. Like Whether this whole actually setup. happens, like you were supposed is uncertain. to be my friend. The measured masses of black holes in binary systems seem to have a lower limit of about four to five solar masses. This suggests that accretion born black holes are unlikely. However, it could simply be that these low-mass black holes would be very difficult to detect. The reality is still uncertain. Oh, to yeah, summarize, there we go. After you turn black like holes angle, are yeah. remnants of massive stars, either birthed directly from the collapse and accretion of their iron cores, or the merging of neutron stars left over from supernovae and some other stellar object. It is theorized that in the early universe, gas was able to collapse directly into an intermediate mass black hole of a thousand to ten thousand solar masses without the fusion of a star's core. But that's perhaps a topic for yet another day. Okay, that's it for this one, y'all. I hope you enjoyed this little lesson. I'll talk to you later.
I don't know what we're going to get into next time. Maybe more about black holes, because this was interesting. What, magnetars? Neutron stars, but scarier. Mm. Core collapse supernova. Stars that shine galaxies. Hawking radiation. Ooh, that one would be interesting. That's an hour. Mmm, that would be interesting. Why does E equal MC squared? <laughs> I like that guy. Anyway, that's the end of that. I will talk to you guys later. Hope you enjoyed. And I hope you learned something. Good night.